year 2020 budget to make sure we've got everything combined as part of this. And as we develop that long-term capital plan, we have assumed some additional long-term borrowing. So when we looked over the next five year period, we have approximately $52 million of capital budgeted as part of this through the current capital plan. Can I stop you a second? Sure. I'm sorry, can you go back one slide? Yeah. <clears throat> can you just <clears throat> talk me through, um, we're including the revenue and expenses for the biogas project, why that's important, because wouldn't we want to look at it in, isolated, in isolation outside of that? So we have, we've we included the revenues uh, for this next year, a, a portion of those revenues. We've included a debt service schedule based on the borrowing. So the borrowing is primarily for that project. Yeah. So we want to make sure those match up timing-wise as part of that. And then there's also additional O&M expenses that go along with that project. So we wanted to make sure that we were conservative in our assumptions yeah. of what that was going to be as we go forward, especially for next year and the following years. Those are kind of two key years as we move forward. Because I think what I'm trying to say is I just want to make sure that we're not, we're collecting revenues based upon that, but then almost giving breaks to the users because, well, now we're taking advantage of this as well. Does that make sense? So Yes, yeah, so when I get to cost of service, I'll talk about how we're allocating those components out. Because, you, yeah, you want to separate those two things. It's like, well, no, that's saving us money in the long run versus, versus savings that we should be passing on to an industrial user or something that like that. That is a correct statement. That's not, that's not contributing maybe to that or something, you know? Yeah, and that's what, when I get to the cost of service, I'll talk about how we've allocated that out a little bit okay. uh, to what customer classes and how that plays into the overall results of the study. Sorry to stop you. I, no, if I, well, I, it, I, have, I still don't understand because I thought we were going to try <laughs> to run that as a separate, almost utility company, and that way it, we would obviously have to pay for the capital costs out of that money. <laughs> Donna Forker, finance director. What we currently have in this model is it's only applied to the, the Sioux City people, not to the sister cities or the outside of the city major industrials, and we can tweak that. Right now, the only people getting credit are the Sioux City people because we are the ones that are assuming the risk. And it's basically programmed just for getting the debt service paid. <coughs> Still doesn't answer the question, but that's fine. So, so right now it is included in the wastewater revenues and expenses. Right, and that's not what I thought we were gonna do. I think I, I thought we had many discussions about that, that it would be separate, but. So of that capital, a big part is the wastewater treatment plant upgrades, but there are also other things that need to happen. There's the cleaning and replacement of sanitary sewer lines, the lift stations. So there's a lot of other things going on as well as we go through this. Uh, the funding for this we have coming from low interest loan proceeds of 30 million. So over half of that 52 million is being funded with low interest loans. A lot of that has to do with the wastewater plant upgrades piece. We're also funding 22 million of that through rates. So on an annual basis, we're putting rates back into the system. That's that renewal and replacement component of it. So we're making sure that we have that aspect of that funded. Uh, now, a key of borrowing is that we have to repay that and we have to maintain legally required debt service coverage ratios. So as part of that, we wanna make sure that whatever the rate projections are, we're able to pay that back and show for the long term that we can meet those coverage requirements. So here's a summary of that revenue requirement. It goes out starting in fiscal year 2020 through 2024. Uh, the dashed line that's somewhat horizontal is the current revenue. So that is today's revenues at present rates. So there's no rate adjustments built into that. 2020 to 2021, that bump is an increase assumed in the biogas revenues. And then it does trend upwards slightly based on assumed customer growth on the system. So as new customers come on, whether they be Sioux City customers or sister city volumes, we've included an assumption on that. Each year is broken down between the main components of the cash basis. We have the bottom box, so the part of those bars, the blue is the O&M expense. So that's our annual O&M expense. You can see that increases slightly over time based on inflation. We have our rate funded capital in the dark gray in the middle. That's that 22 million that's going to fund capital on an annual basis. And then we have the bright green, which is our debt service. So we've had a bump up from 19 to 20, and then another bump from 20 to 21, <coughs> and then it kind of 
consistently stays at that level roughly until we're outside of this five-year window. Uh, we also have the red on tops. It caps a couple of those. That's reserve funding. Essentially, in those years, we have money that is going into reserves and coming out the next year to pay for capital as we go forward on an ongoing basis. The difference between the dashed line and the bars is roughly 7% per year in those first two years. So it would take us seven in 20, seven in 21, and then we've still got some additional outside that. We're focused on the next two years right now for the rate setting purpose for this later this summer as part of that. But that would be the percent change in the overall revenues that need to be recovered through the wastewater utility. So those adjustments are necessary, primarily to fund our capital improvements and maintain our <coughs> adequate debt service coverage ratio. That's a key driver in this as we're issuing debt for the upgrades at the plant. And then also to fund in part inflationary increases in O&M that are continuing. Uh, just as a point of reference, AWWA recently put out a paper that came out of their 2018 rate survey for water and sewer utilities talking about the increases in water and sewer rates and how they have been much higher than general inflation levels, given the infrastructure costs that are out there, all the things that people don't see that are necessary as part of that. So we're working with staff to develop the final revenue requirement and the projections that we've made will maintain a financially healthy and sustainable utility. So that gives us the overall size of the pie. Now we can jump into how we allocate that piece of pie to the different customer classes of service. Now, what is it? Well, it's what I just said, a method to equitably allocate. Why do we do this? Because we don't track costs and no utilities track costs based on who they're serving. We don't say today we're gonna, we're gonna only treat residential wastewater and tomorrow we'll treat the, the commercial wastewater. It all comes down the pipe to the treatment plan. So we need to have a method to allocate. <coughs> and we do this so that we can avoid subsidies, so that each class or customer group understands what their costs are on the system and their rates reflect the cost they place on the system as part of this. So based on those generally accepted approaches, then these, this is considered fair and equitable as part of this. Now, some of the key assumptions for the cost of service, the analysis is based on the fiscal year 2020 revenue requirement. That's really our first year of our rate setting period. So that's the year we want to allocate costs for. And the cost of service process is a three-step approach. So first we need to functionalize, then we classify, then we allocate. So functionalization refers to what type of cost are we incurring? Is it a collection cost? Is it a treatment cost? Is it an admin cost or overhead cost? Essentially, it's the function of managing the utility. That is primarily accomplished through your budgeting and your accounting records, so we have that information. Then we classify that cost, and this is the why. Why did you incur this cost? And when we look at this, we look at different components. So when we look at the cost, we say, did we incur this to meet a volume-related cost? So just to get wastewater from point A to point B, or is it a strength-related cost? And for this study, we have four components, one of them being new, you have three of these existing. We have BOD, biochemical oxygen demand, TSS, total suspended solids, TKN, nitrogen, essentially shorthand version of that, fog, our fats, oil, and greases. So we've allocated costs to each customer class based on how they utilize the system. What is the strength of their wastewater? And then there's a customer component to that also. That we have. There's a billing component, there's an admin component that is allocated on a customer basis as part of that. In layman's terms, it's just justification for <laughs> different rates based on what you're producing. You're exactly correct. Yep, based on their proportional share of the costs they place <laughs> on the system. So it costs us to treat more, I think, TN, T, TKN, right? Yes. It costs us more there. So if you're pumping a whole bunch of that, we need to, we need to charge you more. Basically. That is correct. Yep. And that's exactly what the cost of service is getting at because think of a domestic customer or a residential home, they're discharging something very different than one of your industrial customers. And so you want to make they, sure that they're matching it. It's just like a household. Is that TSS? Is that what they produce? Is that what that's called or no? Am I wrong? Uh, TSS is total suspended solids. So BOD and TSS is the, the, the biological component, BOD, and then s suspended solids is the solid component that comes down the pipe. So as we went through this, uh, you've had some changes in your industrial customers over the last couple of years. 
So we went back through how, what that looked like, what should those typical strength levels be? You know, how do the industrial customers change? How have domestic customers changed if they have at all? Uh, we wanna make sure that we're capturing that nutrient removal. Part of that is the TKN, the nitrogen piece of that. That's something that's gonna be coming up and, and possibly changing with your new permit. And then what else is coming down the pipe? You know, what other future regular, regulatory requirements do we need to plan to, for? So as part of this, we've gone through and looked at, for the treatment plant specifically, why do you have all these different functions in the plan? Is it related to volume, BOD, TSS, TKN, FOG? And we split that up. So now there's an allocation of each of those to each of the customer classes as well. So this study's had more of a focus on the strength <coughs> component than the past studies have to try and reflect where those costs are incurred and why you're incurring those costs going forward. So a couple of the key assumptions here. Uh, again, this is specific to the allocation of costs. On the conveyance system, that collection, transmission, <coughs> trunk system, we've only allocated a portion of that to the sister cities and the industrials that are outside of Sioux City service areas, part of that. And that was to reflect the fact that they only use some of those bigger pipes and it goes directly essentially to the treatment plant. That's an oversimplification, but the big pipes take it right there. They don't benefit from all the smaller pipes that are back here in town and around. That's more of a domestic component. So we actually went through an analysis to determine what portion of that system would, uh, would benefit those other customers versus what would benefit Sioux City's customers as part of that. We've also gone back and allocated costs to everybody on domestic strength levels only. And so we did this for two reasons. One is we allocated all customers, whether new city customers or sister city or outside industrial customers, just the basic domestic strength. So everybody's treated equally in the allocation. But what we did is we added a high strength component as a customer class. And that high strength component picks up the difference or all that, the pounds and loadings to the plant that are over and above domestic. That is then charged back to those industrial customers that are benefiting from that higher strength component. So we're coming back and splitting this up so that everybody's on an even playing field and then those that go over those strength limits that you have today, you're able to <coughs> charge them a strength charge to reflect that. Uh, as we mentioned, biogas, the revenues and expenses, those are city customer only. So the revenues coming in and the expenses going out stay within the domestic and the industrial inside customers as part of that. Sister cities outside industrial don't receive a benefit of that. Uh, essentially, as Donna spoke about, then as we move forward, the city is needing to fund that. So we wanna make sure that that is funded as we go forward based on those overall costs. So those outside customers are not allocated expenses, debt service, uh, O&M expenses, debt service, or the revenue that goes along with that. That stays with the city's customers as part of that. So the way we think about this is each of these allocation factors. So as you go across, it's those same components I talked about, volume, BOD, TSS, nitrogen, fog, customer, and revenue. And if there's a dollar in the volume category, because we've gone through each line item of the budget and said, why did we incur this cost? Is it a volume, is it a BOD, et cetera? So if there's a dollar in that volume bucket, this shows that 59.3 cents of that dollar is allocated to your domestic customers. 13.4 goes to industrial inside, 13.7 industrial outside, and so on. And we do that for each of our components. And so what we do then is add up those costs. It's essentially a weighted average based on how they, their proportional share is. And we compare that to the revenue. So just as a simple version, if you go across the domestic line, domestic customers are 59.3% of the overall volumes. But they're only 41, 42% of the BOD and TSS and they're 35% of the nitrogen, 46% of the fog, and they're 99.9% .9 of your customers, right? Each sister city's a customer, each industrial's a customer. So in total, they're allocated their costs, and we compare that to their revenue, which it, it today is 57.4%. We do that for each class based on how they've uh, utilized the system. 
What that looks like then is we look at that allocation of costs, which is the blue bar or the left-hand bar, compared to those current revenues, which is the orange or the right-hand bar. So what this says going across the page is that the domestic customers are essentially paying their equitable share. Those bars are almost equal. When you start going across the rest of the page, industrial customers, those rates need to increase fairly significantly to reflect just domestic level strength. Same with <coughs> industrial outside and outside municipality, the sister city component. Those rates all need to go up to reflect the cost of just treating domestic strength weight. What's interesting is the high strength charge, that can actually come down slightly. So it was showing that we are picking up a little bit too much there for those customers. Now, if you combine the industrial, industrial outside, and the high strength charge, those, are, those three all kind of go together, then it's slightly greater than the 7% system. So we're going up significantly on the domestic side for industrial and sister cities, but that high strength piece is coming down. So as a global change for them, it's not significant, but there are some changes there uh, based on that. Now, this doesn't mean that each customer is going to get the same adjustment, but if you were to implement cost of service results, which is what this is showing, then that would vary by customer type. We'd still capture the overall 7% bigger piece of pie, but everybody's share has slightly changed. The domestic slice didn't change, but each of the other pieces got slightly bigger and then the high strength came down a little bit as part of that. So to implement pure cost of service, this is what this would look like to meet that overall 7% revenue adjustment. Now that's something I think for the council to discuss uh, on how we approach, not necessarily right this second, but as we go through this process, what the direction would be to implement that overall revenue adjustment and then how we implement or phase in or transition to cost of service results as we move forward over time. So the analysis did show there's cost differences by customer class, but those differences reflect the usage and customer characteristics of each customer class and how they benefit from the system. Uh, it is, this is something that has focused, as I mentioned, more on the strength component than past studies. And this is also something that's going on across the country right now as, folk, as utilities permit requirements are changing and there's a broader focus on what those requirements are to remove nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, et cetera, where that is a significant cost to the utility. We want to show that those customers that are driving that cost should be paying that cost through a cost of service analysis. Uh, again, this is something that should be reviewed periodically uh, as your customers change and an in industry goes away, a new industry comes in. We want to make sure that those loading levels make sense going forward. That also why we're hoping <clears throat> those industrial users and stuff will begin regularly taking samples to see where they're at with levels. Isn't that accurate? Isn't it, Mark, didn't we talk about that as well, right? Uh, or am I, am I off on this? I'm yeah, just trying you, to make sure. Can you ask your question whatever. a little bit? Yeah. Rephrase that if you would. I'm not quite sure I'm following you. Um, I thought we said that beginning or now we would like the industrial users to begin more regularly sampling to know where they're at with the different levels so that we're trying to the, the city code gives us the flexibility to do that, the, the revised city code. So um, and establishing local limits will help with that as well. So, um, but I'm in just short, going yes. Back to, I think that lat or wait, not this slide, that bottom one. Maybe kind of to that bottom point, right? If we need to adjust any, anything that. Well, we regularly we regularly sample and test them now. Uh, the more frequently that we sample and test them, the more I guess accurate <clears throat> yeah. their results are. But considering that there are a number of those, the amount of effort that it takes to, to get there is significant. So we have to look at each one individually and determine who has the greatest chance of impacting our system and focus first on them and then whatever <coughs> else we have available, we can you know, expend resources that way, so. And, and as, as if you move forward with some of these recommendations, that may result in a change 
by those industrial customers. They're gonna weigh the cost of paying a high strength chard versus doing some pretreatment or other processes which can lower their overall strength levels on the system. So I talked earlier about our four strength components, BOD, TSS, and FOG, you have those today. TKM, the nitrogen component, would be a new component. And as we move forward, and as if, if that is included within the overall high strength charge, that could have an impact on some of your customers that are discharging high levels of nitrogen into the system, which is costing you dollars on the treatment side as part of that as well. So I have a question. Um, okay, so we have a, somebody that's gonna do their own treatment, right? Um, what is the difference between them doing it and us doing it? You know, well, they're, they're paying more to do it and, and we're not getting as much back. I mean, so what's the difference? So that that's the economic analysis that those customers have to do is, is it more efficient or cost effective for me as an industry to pre-treat this to domestic levels to stay below the high strength charge limit that the city has versus discharging whatever they may be discharging and paying those charges to the city going forward. So. Either way, they're theoretically incurring those costs. It's just, are they, is the city billing them for that? Or are they paying, you know, paying for that themselves before it reaches the city? So it's really, who wants the hassle? Is that the deal? Could be part of it, yes. And we've had those discussions, Rhonda, with uh, many of the industries, and the general consensus is uh, if we need to treat for nitrogen, the, right now the preference they believe is centralized treatment rather than individual pretreatment at each facility, uh, but it's all going to come down to a business decision on their part. You know what? What's it going to cost? And you know we have a uh, trial that will be uh, a pilot study that we'll be undertaking uh, starting this summer that you guys have already approved us seeking a grant for. Uh, we, we're going to be awarded that grant, and so we hope to sign the contract in in uh, June and then start that study. It'll take about a year to get enough data so that DNR will consider it, you know, worthy of a good review. And uh, we believe that will tell us that we can do centralized treatment uh, or pretreatment of what's called a side stream at the wastewater plant. Basically, it's the water that we squeeze out of the sludge. Uh, if we can provide enough treatment for that, <coughs> it might solve some of the TKN issue and give us some additional capacity. Uh, and so based on that, right now, the general conclusion from the industrial community is we like that approach and we, we at this stage of the game, that's the direction we hope the city will go. Uh, that could change. We, we could find that maybe that process doesn't work well on our type of waste or uh, there's other costs involved or, you know, things that we'll learn during the study, uh, and it may change their decision making then. But they've been very engaged in that discussion. They've had some good ideas as well about TKN, so. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Is your bar graph, uh, did you get your bar graph from the results of the percentages that you were talking about earlier? Correct. That, are those percentages fairly objective or, or are they subjective? Both. So the results here are, are based on how each of these customer groups or classes utilize the system. So I, I would say they're fairly objective, but we have made some assumptions as we've gone through the study. But that was one of the reasons I came back to uh, developing the analysis where everybody is allocated the same strength levels regardless of the four constituents and we pick up the remainder in the high strength because we know what is treated at the plant and we know how many pounds are removed at the plant. And so if we treat everybody as domestic strength, whatever is left over, we know that's the stuff over high strength and that's the piece we need to collect through that charge. So um, cost of service is not ex an exact science. I will say that about it. Uh, it's a time, it's a point in time because we're looking at our current assumptions for flows and loads. That can change over time. We've seen that in the last three years with different customers on the industrial side. And so this does move from time to time. But today, based on what we know, then these <coughs> would be the results that we've elected to move forward with overall cost of service adjustments, we would be moving towards these results. And it would basically be domestic, we could stay flat 
and we would pick up the 7% through the industrial, industrial outside and outside municipality, the sister city component. And that, that's a ch that would be that change in the overall revenues that we would collect. Okay, thank you. I have one more question. So when they pre-treat, do they have the <coughs> same um, <coughs> ingredients that they use, that we use? Or do they have different pre-treatment? And how, how do you, is well, that a dumb question? Somewhat, <laughs> somewhat their decision. Uh, they, they have, in some cases, maybe multiple options. And so whatever they want to spend money on. Uh, do, do they let you know what they're going to do? Yes, what, what, what and, and in some cases we might have them on a compliance schedule uh, and they just need to give us a report every so often that says here's what has been concluded to this point and the direction we think we're going to go. Uh, and we might narrow it down to help them narrow it down to a couple, three options or we might, I don't know that we can specifically require a specific technology, <laughs> but okay, as so long as they meet our objective. <coughs> So my next question is, if they pre-treat and aren't doing a really good job at pre-treating and we're still ended up pre-treating, how does that work? So if they are still, if they're pre-treating but they're still over the limits that right. the city's established for them, they're still paying that high strength charge. Okay. So anytime they pop over that limit, then they're going to pay that through that testing. And, and they could, depending on how it's set up, they could uh, potentially be in violation of their permit limit and subject to enforcement then. So this is the big piece of the, of the study. I mean, also we're talking about overall increases in rates just in general, the size of the pies needs to get a little bigger to pay for the operating capital. But this allocation component, the cost of service is an important aspect because really it comes back to the equity of existing rates and who should be paying for those costs. And with looking at the strength levels, adding TKM, that nitrogen piece to this, then that does move some of the needle essentially a little bit to those customers that are uh, discharging the, those levels of strength for each. So once we know that, then we can design rates. I just have a couple brief slides on rates. Uh, the goal of rate design is to come back and reflect the overall revenue needs of the system any cost of service adjustments that we implement as part of this or a transition to cost of service, and then meet any other rate design goals and objectives, whether that could be revenue stability, uh, ease of administration, customer understanding, et cetera. There's a whole list of rate design goals and objectives that we can look at. But ultimately coming back and designing those rates to reflect the analysis that we've done so far so that we have cost-based and equity. The current rates, just as a quick refresher, domestic is charged, which is your residential and commercial in Sioux City. They're charged a fixed charge based on their meter size plus a volumetric component based on all water use over two CCF, or CCF is 100 cubic feet, a CCF is 748 gallons. So after essentially 1,500 gallons, then customers are paying a, a wastewater bill above that fixed charge. On the industrial side, there's no fixed charge. They are all charged a uniform rate or the same amount regardless of how much wastewater is coming down the pipe. Uh, and again, on top of that, there are the high strength charges if they apply based on each of our three current high strength factors, TSS, BOD, and FOG. And that rate differs between in-city, so Sioux City Industrial versus <coughs> outside Sioux City Industrial customers. The sister city rate, again, is a uniform rate based on that <coughs> measured flow. And then we have septic haulers. Uh, I didn't have those on the chart because it's such a small number, you distorted the whole uh, graph on that. Uh, but septic haulers are charged per load as part of that. But looking forward from my perspective on the rate design side, uh, there's nothing here that I think has to be fixed today. As an example on the rate structure, it's contemporary, reflects what most utilities are doing on the wastewater side. You have a fixed charge on your domestic plus a, a volumetric component. Many times on those large users, it is a, a uniform rate or the same rate for all measured volumes for them. Uh, we would recommend maintaining those high strength charges. The analysis, we calculated an average cost. Right now you have a two tier system where you hit, you go over, and once you go over a certain threshold, it doubles what that surcharge rate is. 
Right now, I've calculated in the study what that average cost per pound is for anything over the limits. And so that would be something that we could look at as part of this, as well as adding the TKN component to that. And then- So you're saying that will still be a two-tier charge or it will be more per pound or is that- uh, that, That's what we're discussing right now. So short-term, probably a two-tier yet, but going forward, that could be something that I'd recommend you look Fair at. Right. Yep, yep. <clears throat> Uh, and then on the industrial side, right now those volumes are billed through the sister cities and they just pick up the high strength charge component of that. Does that still make sense? That's something we're talking about with staff as well. Or is there a different way to do that where they're charged for both their volume and their strength and then the sister cities are billed just the other volumes that come. That adds some complexity, so may not be the best approach, but that's what, what we're thinking about as we go through this. Are there any other things that we should change as part of this be contemporary to reflect what the industry standards are today and as a big picture no you're pretty good where you're at but there's maybe some minor things that we want to adjust as we go forward that i would recommend that again that's the last bullet point i just want to make, uh, yeah. sure, I just want to make sure i got that right yeah so right now an industrial customer they are not billed a volume charge that is picked up through the sister city flows that come come through uh, for for outside Sioux City. Yeah, outside industry. Yes. Uh, they only pay the high strength component of that bill. So if they're over the limits, they get a bill for and that. Sister City bills them? No, uh, that, that industrial customer is billed for the high strength. On the flow no, side, the yes, yes. They would pick up that cost. And pass so we're that. saying whether or not we want to separate them or whether they want to separate them. or And whether we can as part of that. We have the high strength inf information, but how would that work from how would we administrative? Because it's going in one pipeline. Correct. So, okay. so if they, okay, so if they, <clears throat> that makes sense. if we charge them for both, why couldn't they charge their, this? Say that again for me. Okay, well maybe, maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm hearing this wrong. Am I, am I saying this wrong, Mark? I must be. Okay, so, so the volume plus what gets charged? So right now, explain that to me first. So right now, the volume from the industrial customer yep. is counted in the bill with the sister city. So all that volume coming down the pipe from that city is includes the industrial strength component. How do the sister cities know what to charge them then for the volume? So they're doing what we're doing right now is they go back and look at their total costs and allocating that out between all their customers as well. So it's just that industrial can be challenging in some ways on how we come back and bill them. There's various ways to look at that. Um, and so that's part of what we were looking at is, is there a better way to do that? And I'm not sure that there is uh, because this keeps it fairly simple and straightforward. You're only dealing with the high strength side. One of the things we're looking at in the sister city agreements, uh, and I don't know whether we'll get buy-in on the other side, is uh, essentially we send that sister city the bill for the entire city and it's their responsibility to collect break it down for those industries now we would still have to sample and test for those and and do enforcement and those types of things because it comes to our facility and so by federal law we're required to have the pretreatment program but uh, from Sioux City's perspective I see it as an advantage to just have one one bill and it's up to that sister city we we charge them everything and then they need to go out and and uh you know is that because the added cost of om or something or just breaking it down or it's just they'll easier have, for us to they'll do have, administratively they'll have he'll have to allocate like the dog food factory those got to be allocated to north sioux so they know what to charge right but it's a cash flow problem we're carrying that for 30 days now and these and guys if, are going to have to start picking that up and if the industry doesn't pay, we don't really have a mechanism for collecting that. So. so conclusions here, entire study, uh, as we talked about, revenue adjustments are necessary for the next two years. We're estimating a, about a 7% per year as part of that. That's driven in part by maintaining our debt service coverage ratios. Uh, in order to issue the long-term debt, we have to have those in place as part of that. Uh, so that we can fund these capital improvements at the wastewater treatment plant. 
The cost of service did show differences. It's uh, coming back to the council and discussions with staff on how we implement that, when we implement that, and how we step towards that uh, as you move forward through that cost of service <coughs> process. Again, this study has more of a focus on that strength component simply because that's something that you're starting to face now with the nitrogen and, and the impacts of those on there. And then ultimately we design rates based around that overall philosophical or policy direction that we would receive to come back to the actual rates that each customer group would be charged. And with that, I'll take any other questions, comments. Oh, I have one more, sorry. Next steps, uh, any comments or that you may have for us today uh, to move forward, then we'll finalize the overall analysis uh, and then work with staff to come back and bring back those final proposed rates for consideration. Now I'll take any comments or discussion. I'm not sure this question's necessarily for you, but when was, when was our last rate increase? What year was it, percentage? I believe that we've had, we had a 3% rate increase two years ago and before that was like eight years ago. So 3% as recent as 2017? Yes. I believe it's July 1st of 16, 16. for fiscal 17. That was just a one year? One year. Didn't increase it after that, okay. I can. I will get all the. the Re reason why I'm asking because you've you stated a couple times we're looking at seven percent, right? Each year for two years, seven percent per year. And when we were going through the budget, we were we were up at eight eight and a quarter. And we've gotten it down to seven. And that was done through redoing the capital and stretching it out a little bit further. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Do you guys want to do council concerns now or do you want to break? I don't care. We're not going to. We we are you talking to the council? We need to adjourn this meeting then we'll start at 4 o'clock. I know council you're trying to see. Concerns is not really a deal, but that's okay. <laughs> Move we adjourn. Second. Moore? Aye. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Capron? Aye. Oh, I appreciate that. Aye. Take a 10 minute so break. Scott? Here. Waters? Here. Capron? Here. Gretkin? Here. Moore? Here. Can we stand for a moment of silence for followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I need Adam Paulson, Lance Dake, Ron, Rick Simons, Mark Buer, D Don Jones, and Jeremy May. Get me up the mic. I like the polo. That's a sharp. Thank you. Are we using this today? All right. The electronic. The foundation is re grabbed on the morning of May 2nd, 2019. A hall around loading an existing wastewater treatment plant such as right grab and eat down and became overcome by fumes to his tank truck. Grab the wastewater treatment plant staff recognized the security of the situation and asked quickly to lower the individual from the top of the tank truck to the ground. To begin performing CPR while waiting for emergency services to arrive. And whereas Having not been the quick thinking and backsliding of staff, the individual would likely not have survived. Now, therefore, I, Robbie Scott, Mayor of the City of Sioux City, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby command Adam Paulson, Lance Day, Rick Simons, Mark Burr, Don Jones, and Jeremy Mayo to their quick response recognition of the severity of the medical emergency and immediate actions which result in the avoidance of a terrible tragedy. Without one of these, I will provide one.
going to be too shy to talk? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just, just to give you a, a brief uh, synopsis of what happened without taking a lot of time, Mayor and Council, uh, we're very proud of these uh, gentlemen and their actions as well as other staff. Uh, as the mayor mentioned uh, several days ago now, we did have uh, a significant event happen where a uh, hauler uh, was overcome by fumes. Uh, he collapsed on top of his semi-tanker. Uh, these gentlemen saw that happen and quickly got him off the tanker with assistance from some contractors out there, uh, performed CPR. Uh, Rick was the one that actually performed the CPR and he did that uh, uh, within probably about two weeks after receiving CPR training oh, wow. uh, that the city had provided. Uh, a little hard to get him, not get emotional about it, but. Yeah. Could have been a tragedy, that's for sure. Good job, yeah. guys. We've yeah. Thank you very Good. much. EMTs did tell us that the gentleman had one minute left to live, uh, so they saved his life. Good for you. Fantastic. Good job, guys. Thank Great you. Way to go. Thank you. Take us proud. Thank That's you. good. Thank you. There is one little thing about it. Um, the following Saturday, the gentleman did show back up at the facility, him and his wife. Um, it's amazing. He's doing great. Good. Good. Fantastic. Good. It's good to hear. Thank you. Arnie, I guess I have one for you. I didn't realize I didn't go through that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> huh? Yeah. Perhaps public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities, and services that are vital to the importance of sustainable and resilient communities and to the public health, high quality of life, and well being of the people of Sioux City. And whereas those infrastructures, facilities, and services not be provided without the dedicated efforts of public works professionals who are engineers, managers, and employees of all levels of government and the private sector who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our nation's transportation, water supply, water treatment, solid waste systems, public buildings, and other structures and facilities essential to our citizens. And whereas the Sioux City public interest for the citizens in Sioux City is to gain knowledge and to maintain a progressive interest in understanding the importance of public works and public public works program in their respective communities. And whereas the year 2019 marks the 59th annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association. Now therefore I, Robert E. Scott, Mayor of the City of Sioux City, Iowa, on behalf of Council, do hereby proclaim May 19th through 25th, 2019 as National Public Works Week. I urge all citizens to join the representatives of the APWA and government agencies in activities, events, and ceremonies designed to pay tribute to our public works professionals, engineers, managers, employees, and to recognize the substantial contributions they make to protecting our national health, safety, and quality of life. I want to thank the mayor and council for this proclamation uh, acknowledging APWA's Public Works Week. I want to make sure that everyone knows and acknowledges the fact that public works employees cover several departments within the city of Sioux City. The public works department, obviously, which covers ma street maintenance, traffic control, engineering, parking and skywalk and our, our fleet services, but also utilities department, which covers our water, wastewater treatment, our water distribution, our waste and stormwater collection systems, and our solid waste and recycling programs, <coughs> and also our parks department, which staffs and maintains our parks, pools, and splash pads. Many people don't even know what public works employees do until they hit a pothole, don't have water, or see trash in the park. I commend our public works employees in the parks, utilities, and public works department for the work they do to diligently maintain our city's infrastructure amenities and always keeping our number one goal of keeping our citizens safe and our employees safe. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. We'll go on to uh, interview for civil service, O'Neill Daniels. Come to the microphone, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you want to serve. Okay. My name is O'Neill Daniels. I'm the father of three. Uh, my wife is Joy. That's with me today, Joy Taylor. Um, we moved into Sioux City in 2006, so we've been here 13 years. I uh, have one son that's grown living in Atlanta, Georgia, and my two younger kids go to East High and East Middle. Uh, I was asked to apply to this position by a co, well, a member of the church that I belong to, which is Mount Zion. 
When he asked me to apply, honestly, I didn't even know that Sioux City had a Civil Service Commission. Um, after thinking about it and researching exactly, you know, what that commission does, I decided to apply. And also they give me uh, a great feeling of serving the community, doing something. Since I've been here 13 years, I want to just contribute more. What brought you to Sioux City? Uh, my wife uh, received a job offer from CBA. Okay. Good. Well, we appreciate your applying. Thank you. You bet. For sure. What did you find uh, one of your biggest challenges being in the unemployment office in Mississippi? I thought that was interesting that you had that <laughs> for a background. Well, I'm originally from Mississippi, so going back, it was it was it was easy to you know deal with the people there work there it was just you know i was coming back home so it was it was easy to do it because most of the people know everyone and you know you they, they easy going just as long as you show them respect they give you respect sure sure good what, point what you live what city did you live in in mississippi a small town called greenville but before then i worked in dc which i stayed I think I was there about 17 years, and then out in L.A. with the agency for nine years. Thank you for making an application. This is one commission that's <clears throat> time-consuming, and, and you really have to be committed to it. So thank you for doing that. And then would you also thank your member at church for um, recommending. recommending that you apply for this? So we're, we're trying to get the word out on our boards and commissions, and I'm, mm -hmm. I've, I'd rather see it work that way than just... Uh, do a general advertisement. So thank you for sharing that information with us. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you very thank much. Thank you. We'll let thank you know. You. Yeah. Appreciate, Appreciate you. you coming down. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go to the consent agenda, which today is items through through 9B. Consider all items passed unanimously, unless a separate roll call votes asked for by a council. If you want to speak on any item, please come up as I read it. State your name and address for the record. If you want to speak on an item not on the agenda, please come up under citizen concerns. I'll move the consent agenda. Second. Item three is reading the city council minutes of May 8th and 13th, 2019, and the city clerk would like to say something. Yes, I would like to point out an error that I corrected on the walk-on item at the end of last week's meeting. It was numbered incorrectly as 2019-0402 and has been corrected to 2019-0401. Thank you. Four is a resolution amending position classification manual by adding a, a custodial position in the transit department. <clears throat> Five are actions relating to street closures. A is a resolution temporary closing a portion of 4th Street for downtown live concerts. D is a resolution Temporarily closing various streets in Leeds area June 8th and 9th for the Leeds Community Day Street Dance and Car Show. C is a resolution temporarily closing various streets in Leeds area for June 7th for the Leeds Community Days Parade. Got that one on your calendar? Got that right on my calendar, Mayor. Okay, that's good. I know you love a good parade. <laughs> Six are actions relating to bonds. A is items 6 through A. To 60 are resolutions directing the sale of GO bonds not to exceed the various amount. See the list and come forward if you have any questions. We've been furnished that uh, earlier today. Did you guys all get the bond deal? Yes. Yes. Fairly good rates, huh? Couple one under and two right on the money, so that's pretty good. Good. Thank you. Seven are actions relating to agreements and contracts. A is a resolution approving a consulting services <coughs> agreement with Cannon Moss Brigger for the airport terminal ter terrazzo repair project. I had a question about that one. Nice book for you to copy. Mike, from my understanding, I was looking at it, and I think we have talked about some of these different contracts before, but was there a reason we didn't put it out to bid, or we just thought that this was... It was voted on by the committee, is that correct? For Canada Moss's contract? Yeah. I, I think going back to probably, they were the um, lead on this, on the remodel process about 10 years ago. <laughs> so they're very familiar with the terminal. So I think it was natural for them to provide the service. They've also tried to bring in the manufacturer rep to try and resolve this without doing a full-blown fix and remodel. Yeah. So they've helped coordinate 
um, trying to prepare a fix along the way, and it's just it's come down to how big is the job? Uh, roughly about two hundred thousand. And how big is the next job? About four hundred. Also found some efficiencies probably to do these together. Just they expect um, so blended rate. It's about fourteen percent. I think, you know, when you're going to fees, um, there's a vertical element to this with the terminal going <coughs> upper floors as well. And we're trying to coordinate these things together, probably, you know, due to their um, discussions with contractors to have one <coughs> oversight to probably save some money when they actually go to bid, the actual work itself. Um, and so that's, I guess we're trying to tie these together for that purpose. We'll also plan to close the terminal for a few days in late August and September due to the runway project. We're also, so we're trying to coordinate the terrazzo is sitting right outside the TSA area is the worst of it. So it's really gonna impact the service of people going in and out. So we're trying to coordinate it with that at the same time for timing. Okay, okay. thanks Mike. Here is a resolution approving a consulting service agreement with Cannon Moss Brigger for the Air Tort Tower reskin project. C is a resolution approving a water collection and testing agreement with the Siouxland District Health Department. D is a resolution approving a change order number three with Subserpco for the Big Sioux River Trail Phase One project. I need to abstain on D, please. E is a resolution consenting to the IFA's land use restriction agreement related to the home investment pro partnership funds for the Aberdeen Apartments. Mayor, I need to abstain on that item. Eight are actions relating to property. A is the resolution of proposing to sell property at 451 Burton Street to petitioners Majessa and Terrence Hargraves. B is the resolution of proposing to sell property at 411 Burton Street to petitioners Billy Jonathan Garcia Perez. C is the resolution of proposing to sell property at the vacated Peters Avenue to petitioners Richard Mar Merla. D is the resolution of proposing to sell property at 3001 13th Street to petitioners William Vanderveen. E is a resolution of proposing to sell property to vacate West 20th Street, petitioners Dan Gustin, Don Gustin. F is a resolution granting a permit, a permit to Fibercom to maintain underground cable in the area of 405 Wesley Parkway. Nine are applications for beer and liquor license. See the list come forward if you have any questions. Do I need to go back and read anything? Okay. We'll vote electronically. Passes 5-0 unless otherwise somebody abstain. 10 are hearing and resolution approving plans and specifications for Div Division Street paving project. This street failed because it's like a water, it's like an underground well system up there. Are, are we, what are we gonna do to make sure it doesn't fail again? The well, I'm asking the question first. Okay, I'll, I'll move it, I'll move it. Second. Hearing's now open. Gordon Fair, city engineer. Uh, your question about the high water table there, we are going to put some base in there, uh, a, an aggregate ba sub base or base. We're also going to treat the sub base and we're putting in um, fabric, geofabric, textile fabric underneath to keep, separate the base from the sub base. Okay. And we're putting in uh, drain tiles along the side also. Okay. Anyone else be heard? Hearing is closed. <clears throat> Passes 5011 is a hearing and resolution amending the budget for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2019. I will move that. Second. Hearing's now open. Would anybody like to speak on this item? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Passes 5-0. 12 is a hearing and resolution accepting the proposal of Lim Bloom Services for land in the combined Floyd River Urban Renewal Area deferred from May 13th 
I'll move to defer till June 3rd, 2019. Second. Hearing is open and closed, do we? Because mm -hmm. we're deferring. Passes 5013 is a resolution awarding to a motor parts supply agreement to AutoZone Parts for auto parts in the central maintenance garage. I'll move that. Second. Why is this going to be better than the last one we had? We got out of that one. Cost us money, I think, to get out even. Why are we doing this? Uh, Daryl Bullock, acting fleet manager. Um, the previous one was with Napa that we got out of, and then this last year we entered into an agreement with Motor Parts Central um, with a pricing structure that is, uh, the pricing of the parts is good. The, the issue that we've got with that is more about the delivery of parts on a timely fashion, the items that they actually stock in, in their store so that we don't have to pay freight on those things coming in, the availability of parts during longer hours based on the retail environment that they set, the dedicated staff, we looked at seven different categories when we approached it this particular year and feel that this is a better choice to go with this time. It was a one-year deal? One-year deal. With the option of... With an option, yes. <clears throat> Carol, how do you know it? There's 1.1 million in motor parts purchasing anticipated in the next year. Based is on, that based off history? Based on prior history. Okay. Yeah, it fluctuates depending on, you know, if you have a life cycle on, on a lot of vehicles or equipment that's getting to the end of its life cycle, obviously we're gonna spend more in parts in those years than when we have new equipment that's out there. You know, we, you know, buying some of this newer equipment and some of the better warranties and that we're getting on some of this equipment and better packages that we're getting, we're seeing some of those numbers come down a little bit and saving us considerable amount of money um, in the first year cycle after some of the wheel loaders, for instance, that were purchased versus first year of the prior models, we saved uh, six to $8,000 per unit on those. Terrific. I see uh, AutoZone has uh, not only 1,500 government fleet customers in that, uh, or the hard copy we had, but it has a hot shot delivery. Yeah. You I actually get parts in 45 minutes? <laughs> We actually get them in less than that. Typically, really? typically the parts that we can't get at our current vendor because they don't stock that particular item, we'll, we'll call around and get best pricing that we can get. This will save us staff time by getting a vendor that stocks more of those parts. But typically when we see those, we're getting 20 to 30 minute turnaround time for that. Additionally, if, they're, if their local stores don't have it, they make runs down from their Sioux Falls distribution center twice a day. So our night shift could be received in an order as well as our day shift. Terrific. Wow, good job. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Saving us money there, Daryl. Ryan. Boy, oh, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Passes 5014 is a resolution authorizing the mayor to deliver notice to the mayor of North Sioux City terminating the sewage agreement deferred from December 3rd, 2018, deferred from March 4, 2019, deferred from March 11, 2019. I'll move the deferral until August 19, 2019. Second. <clears throat> Do we anticipate another one, August 19th? Yeah, exactly. Passes 5 0. 15 is a resolution authorizing the mayor to deliver a notice to the mayor of South Sioux City terminating the sewage treatment agreement deferred from December 3rd, 2018, deferred from March 4th, 2019, deferred from March 11th, 2019. I'll move the <coughs> deferral until August 19th, 2000. Second. Passes 5-0. 16 is a resolution authorizing the mayor to deliver a notice to the mayor of Sergeant Bluff terminating sewer treatment agreement deferred from December 3rd, 2018, deferred from February 4th, 2019, deferred from March 11th, 2019. Motion request to defer this item to August 19th, 2019. I'll move that. Second.
passes 5-0. Citizen concerns, are there any, any citizens would like to be heard, please come up to the microphone, state your name and address for the record, please. Is it this one? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, uh, Megan Murphy, I'm visiting from Seattle, Washington, and um, I go to city council meetings there and they have a lens, two lenses, I thought you would find helpful, um, environmental impact statement, and racial social justice lenses. So say for example, if like in the city of Seattle, like if you were to try to introduce more green jobs into the area or declare Sioux City um, a sanctuary city, or if you were going to analyze the pollution um, from the factory farms up north, um, or say um, you were gonna analyze if Stephen King should resign um, since he was asked to step off all of his committees, um, for meeting with um, neo-Nazis, then you could look through the environmental impact statement or the racial social justice lens, and that could help um, be better service uh, providers to our community of Sioux City, who is a progressive, as you said, town, um, looking for um, progressive jobs and uh, equity and justice for all, as we said in the Pledge of Allegiance. So, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for coming. Anybody else to be heard? Come to the microphone again, state your name and address, please. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Rosenbaum, and I'm here with Marta Nelson. We're members of the Daughters of the American Revolution, and we're here to tell you today about an exciting project that uh, we are completing for the city and the history of Sioux City. I'm gonna hand these out while I give Marta the microphone. I thought she was coming to tell us about our class reunion in 1969, but I guess. Well, this takes back to 1920. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I haven't been to enough of the planning meetings to know anything yet. Thank you. I was on council back um, I am a retired teacher, so I have no trouble talking in front of people. So I have actually written a speech to, to rein me in slightly, because otherwise was, I, I will tell you more than you want to know. Um, this has to do with a historical Thanks. monument that went missing. We rediscovered it and we are rededicating it and putting it back together again. As the early pioneers of Sioux City moved into their later years, they and their children began a number of projects to preserve the local history for future Sioux City residents. The first big project was the Floyd Monument. Um, the cornerstone was laid in 1900, and thousands of people came to a dedication ceremony on Memorial Day in 1901. The next thing, the next project generally, was the location of Chief War Eagle's grave. It had once been marked by wooden pickets and had been lost. And they went hunting, the grave was rediscovered, and DAR and the GAR, which is the Grand Army of the Republic, the Civil War veterans, spearheaded a project to mark it with a permanent monument. And other people were involved, War Eagle Association, the Woodbury County Pioneer <coughs> Club, and the Sons of the American Revolution. And in 1922, the first War Eagle monument was dedicated, and on the same occasion, the city of Sioux City dedicated War Eagle Park. A national DA DAR project of the 1920s was discovering and marking and commemorating pioneer trails throughout the country before they were lost. This was a great project for Midwestern and Western groups because we didn't have Revolutionary War artifacts to preserve and protect. And our chapter, Martha Washington chapter, had a committee that went to work on marking the old trail along the bluffs. On May 26, 1929, 300 people attended Martha Washington Chapter's dedication of a monument to the Old Missouri River Trail. <coughs> and this marked the, where the early Native Americans, trappers, and pioneers had engraved it into the landscape. At that time, you could still see the marks of the trail in the prairie, but as the decades passed, evidence of the trail disappeared, streets and roads were moved, and the monument was lost. In 2015, we went on a search for this missing monument. We ran across a program from the dedication, and n I couldn't find a single person in Sioux City, I've lived here all my life, that had ever heard of this thing or knew where it was. So we began looking. Uh, the museum archives and the public library were our first places. And through a combination of research, serendipity, serendipity stubbornness, and pure luck, we have managed to locate the spot. 
Exactly a year ago to today, the Sioux City Journal published uh, an article by Mason Doctor about this mysterious rock and where it had gone. In less than 24 hours, we had a reply from Ed Porter, the former general photographer, who sent us a photo with his wife and the rock. He gave a tour to Tom Munson, the museum archives manager, who helped us figure out that yes, this really was the rock, not just any old rock. And at this point, I'm gonna turn the, the story over to Beth to tell you what's coming up next. So we're really excited. We found out that in 1929, when this was dedicated, Stan Munger's great-grandma was the regent of the DAR at the time, the role that I serve now. And uh, uh, Tally, Mr. Tally, King James, his great-grandpa was the man that abstracted the property. So this has great history. This is a big piece of Sioux City's history. All of the history teachers, we've had local professors and news media are very excited because this will be the trifecta when fourth and fifth graders go to visit the Brulier Cabin, War Eagle Monument, and now the Old Missouri River Trail. Um, so Ed Porter told us, we know where this rock is. We went out and found it, and there it was. Uh, the base was eroded and gone, and someone had stripped off the bronze plaque. Um, so unfortunately, we just had this huge boulder out in a ravine with a lot of glass and garbage. Uh, but I am so excited. The museum found the actual blueprint for the copper plaque or the bronze plaque, and uh, we called the original foundry that made it. And uh, unfortunately, um, the tariffs that have been imposed made that foundry lock up its doors. But Mr. Andrew Galinsky from here in town from the foundry got me in touch with a friend in uh, Cannon Falls, Minnesota. We have a beautiful bronze plaque. Um, I've been working very closely with the Native American community. We got very good advice from City Attorney Du Bois about uh, working with them because War Eagle Park is actually a cemetery. It's sacred ground for our Native Americans. So we've been working with the Yankton Sioux Tribe and the Winnebago Tribe <coughs> uh, to make sure that we are culturally sensitive and that this is done correctly. Uh, so they are pleased with the work. Uh, Matt Salvatore from your city Parks and Rec has been incredible. Uh, we are happy to tell you that just today the base was made and I got a call at three o'clock that our rock was up on its base. So we have a signage coming like you see in a national park explaining the old Missouri River Trail. We have the beautiful bronze plaque waiting to be installed. And on June 9, 2019 at three o'clock, we're having our unveiling. We've invited dignitaries such as yourself. Uh, City Council Member Capron has agreed to speak. We have a Native American prayer. Uh, Mr. Frank Lemire will be speaking also, and we have our uh, state regent from the DAR coming. So it's really an important piece of uh, Sioux City and Sioux land history that uh, I'm just so pleased that we could restore and save uh, because if we hadn't done it, I'm afraid it would have just been a rock in a ravine forever. So uh, thank Good you for job. giving us a few minutes. And uh, it <laughs> took you know many people from your city to help us and the Native American community, and they are very pleased too that we are doing this because it shows reconciliation, and uh, you know they want to see more of this. So it's going to be a very nice event. So we hope that uh, you can attend, and thank you for giving us some time. I'm sure, uh, I'm so sure Ed Porter's you. listening at home, and he'll be texting me when I make this statement. But I'm sure he was around in 1920. <laughs> <laughs> he remembered it. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. Yep, thank you. Anyone else be heard? Council concerns, Mr. Gretkin. Uh, just a brief recap again. Uh, uh, Rhonda and I did meet along with uh, members of Public Works with uh, four of the residents off of uh, West Kings Highway. And they had a good conversation and a discussion about uh, what they would like and some issues and questions that they had. I'll work with the city attorney, share that information with her, and, and as, I, as we get more information, uh, we don't think anything probably, Dave, help me out if I'm missing anything, but the, the 
box culverts not going in for a couple of years, and that would have to be done first before anything could be done uh, with the road itself. But uh, we, again, it was a good meeting. Uh, have some issues to, to look into, and then we'll, we'll probably meet with them again in the next uh, couple of months <coughs> and uh, try to see where we're at then. But. It went well, and I'll uh, send you a copy of the email I send uh, on to the city attorney. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. That's it. That's it? Okay. Well, I want to acknowledge somebody here for that just passed. Um, Steve Allspot. He was our first writer for the Circe Journal, and he worked for it for them for over 30 years. And, and I've known him very well uh, throughout the 30 years, and and uh, he was just a great guy. Not only was he a great sports writer, but he, but he was a great guy. So this is for him. So it's, this is kind of like, uh, we're gonna put him on a baseball field. We'll pull, put all ourselves on a baseball field, right? We get up to bat and we're batting for our life. You know, we can hit a foul, we can hit a curveball, we can uh, make it to first, second, third, hopefully, maybe we'll get a home run in, in, a, in a, the life. But Steve did that, and I don't know. I tell you what, I, I had a bunch of stuff wrote out here. I'm, I'm going to read a couple couple things. Steve was a person you, you, could, you could count on and, and you could trust. He had integrity, he had a smile, and he had a love for life and sports. He was also a good friend. He had that storytelling knack. He wrote how he felt. And I have known Steve for 30 years. Steve uh, lived his life with no regrets. His partner and significant other, Sandy Butcher, enjoyed the last eight years together. It was a love of its own. Um, but Steve had his massive stroke. Sandy was by his side. He wasn't on this journey alone. His colleagues and best friends were also by his side. Terry Hersom, Barry Poe, and Jerry Geist, and many others would call, go and visit him uh, just to see how Steve was doing. Terry Hurston said it, said it the best. For when the one great score comes to mark against your name, he writes not that you won or lost, but it's how you play the game. Steve, my friend, you hit a home run on life. You did make it every, you did make every moment a blessing to all of us. And I, you know, he's get, he's going to be, be missed. He's he was a wonderful person. His funeral is Friday at Sunnybrook and. Um, he's going to have many people showing up for that, that from all over the country, I'm sure. So, um, Godspeed to, to Steve, and, and um, he's going to be missed. So <coughs> that's what I got. Thank you. <clears throat> nice. And he was a good, uh, I knew him for a long time myself, and, and uh, easy to talk to, and a great conversationalist when it came to sports. So, he will be missed. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, tomorrow, there's a Gordon Drive Viaduct, the public meeting. It's going to be held at the convention center. I believe it's from 5 to 7. Is it 5 to 7? Do you guys know? Yeah. 5 to 7 at the convention center. Um, so if you'd like to hear some of the plans, <coughs> just a general discussion about options that the Iowa DOT is looking at for the viaduct. <clears throat> Let's see. Mayor. On um, Saturday evening, uh, Rhonda and the mayor and I hosted the Northwest Iowa League of Cities um, folks that came into town, and uh, we showed them the downtown area by going on a little walking tour between <laughs> between where we had dinner and uh, attending the Bandits game. And what a shootout that was! Um, what was the final score? Seventy-nine to seventy-one. One. One. 79 to 71. Yeah, it was a crazy game. It, it really was. It was a and, lot of fun. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting. I wanted to share this quickly, and it's it's both males and females, but they'll they'll be going to the indoor football game for the first time with the attitude, you know, we don't really like football. We don't watch football. But once they see the Bandits play indoors, uh, it's it's just a way different game, isn't it, Rhonda? Way different. High scoring, and it's just it just moves along. 
each and every one of the uh, people that joined us Saturday evening really enjoyed it. So I wanted to pass that on and, and thank the mayor for his hospitality excited as well. Excited fans too, I might add. Do I? Excited fans. Oh. I'm telling you, they get excited. Bob. Oh my gosh, yes. They, they love your boys. Well, there's a one point difference. <laughs> What's that? Came toward the end. I oh, I know it. It was going back and forth the whole time. Yeah, it was. Um, one other thing I forgot to mention uh, on the airport terminal, airport tower, I just wanted to say because the boards and commissions are important to me, uh, the airport board of trustees did recommend approval um, of those two items and I just wanted to pass that on because I appreciate their input on items that come before the city council. And that's all I have. Um, we don't meet until June 3rd since next Monday is a holiday. So. I Thank you again for making a, the month of May successful for us. And you know what? Thanks for telling us that because I'd have been sitting here waiting for you. No, you about not, that. Oh, yes, yeah, I would have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't you. want to miss a day. That's all I have here. <laughs> I'll move we adjourn. Second. Waters? <clears throat> Aye. Capron? Well, actually, Aye. hold on. Vern, did you have something? No, I just wanted to make sure. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're yep. good. You're yep. good to go. Sorry, I forgot that I saw you come in and I want to make sure you're all right. No, appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank Sorry, you. Lisa. That's okay. Capron? Aye. Gretchen? Aye. Moore? Aye. Scott? Aye. 